Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our program. Welcome to our 2G Tuesday program. My name is Thorne Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Our 2G Tuesday series builds on our successful monthly Sunday with Survivor programs, which we've been offering for more than a year and provides a venue for the children of Holocaust survivors to share their parents' or their families' stories, safeguarding them for the future. Tonight, Meryl Menashe will share the story of her father-in-law, Nassim Menashe, and several other family members who were originally from Salonika, Greece. Before we get to her presentation, I want to put in some announcements, as I often do, and just share some upcoming programs with you. First, let me mention that I'm gonna be back for my next Curator's Corner program, short programs where I talk about a particular object or image in our collection. I'll be back tomorrow for my next Curator's Corner. I'll be talking about a photograph in our museum of the Anschluss, the so-called German annexation of Austria that took place on March 12th, 1938. So just uh, later this week is the anniversary. Uh, our, another program I wanted to mention is on Tuesday, March 15th, next Tuesday, where in honor of Women's History Month, HMTC's David Taub Real Upstander film series will present a virtual screening of The Codebreaker, the American Experience documentary about Elizabeth Smith Friedman, one of the leading code breakers during World War I and World War II. And to lead us into that screening and to answer questions, we're gonna be joined by Melissa Davis, the Library and Archives Director of the George C. Marshall Foundation, which holds the papers of Elizabeth Smith Friedman. And one more program to mention, I want to share that on Monday, March 21st, we are going to be offering a sneak peek at some of the content that will be included in the upcoming concert at Carnegie Hall in April. Join us to learn about the connections between the pieces of music that will be performed and some of the background of those pieces, including details about the piece that will be premiered at Carnegie Hall, Michelle Asael's Auschwitz Symphonic Poem, that was written in 1948 but has never been performed at least not until this coming April. I believe that Merrill is gonna share a family connection to Michelle Asael. So there's a kind of more in the, more about that program that's coming up in, in Merrill's presentation. To learn more about any of these programs, you can always find a full schedule of our activities on our website at www.hmtcli.org and then click on the events tab. Okay, enough of my announcements. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, I would like to introduce the man who is behind our both our 2G Tuesday series and our Sunday with Survivors programs, and that's Mr. Michael Mantel. Michael is a 3G. Two of his grandparents are survivors and they instilled in him the need to not let the history of the Holocaust and their particular histories be forgotten. Michael reached out to us over a year ago and asked to have a program with a Holocaust survivor for his family. And in the aftermath of that program, we had more discussions and realized that this was not something that should be limited to a single family, but made as a public program. And our, two, our Sunday with Survivor series was launched. And then more recently he said, hey, Thorne, let's do something with two Gs as well. And so he raised the idea of expanding our program and we've started the 2G Tuesday program as well. I'm grateful for his continuing support and the interest of his family. And I'd like to turn it over to Michael for an introduction for this evening's presentation. Michael? Thank you so much, Thorne. Uh, as always, thank you for everything you do to help make these uh, Sundays with Survivors and 2G Tuesdays programs uh, the success that they are. Uh, thank you to everyone at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center for all the work you do every day. Um, and thank you to everyone here today uh, joining us for our 2G Tuesdays event. Uh, I'd like to also give a very special thank you to all of our speakers, the survivors and children of survivors, especially tonight's speaker, uh, Meryl Minash. And um, we had a brief introduction, uh, so I won't uh, repeat it. So Thorin, thank you so much for doing all of the introductions. I also want to remind everyone if they can save the date, um, we have uh, Sundays with Survivors. On Sunday, April 10th, we'll be joined by Judith Steele, a Holocaust survivor who was on the ill-fated St. Louis. So uh, please join us Sunday, April 10th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and again, I wanna thank everyone for being here tonight. One of the things that makes this uh, extremely special is that we offer the Q&A um, 
uh, portion at the end of the program. So we ask everyone during the program to think of your questions or comments um, to share with Merrill. You can either raise your actual hand or raise uh, emoji uh, hand raise. Uh, and we can call on you if we don't see your hand raised. Uh, you may unmute yourself uh, and ask your questions or share your comments. Or if you write it in the chat, Thorne and I can ask your questions or, or share your comments with Merrill uh, at the end of the program. And again, I just want to thank everyone for being here. And with that, uh, I turn it over to Merrill. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. And I am so honored to have all of you in this room with me to share the, the Menashe family's uh, history as well as the larger history of the Jewish community of Salonika. Um, as so many of you here, friends, family, and I'm gonna give you a proper, my name is Meryl Menashe. I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. His name is Leon Beck. And he has been my motivating force, my inspiration. And also, sadly, I wanted to go back to his hometown, but that's going to have to wait because right now it's under fire. But as I was growing up, the Holocaust was very important to me, and it was important to me because of Leon. It was also important to me because of the community that I grew up in. Forest Hills, Queens, I was surrounded by survivors. And as I grew and started to learn more, I met and married my husband, Jack Menasha in 1975. It was a few years ago. Um, and I knew his family growing up. I didn't know them well. And it became very natural for me to be the conveyor of their history to the world because I was a historian in the family. I was a student of the Holocaust. It just made sense for me to be the interpreter of the photos and to share it out with, with the rest of the world. And what I've started to call this program is the tragedy and triumph of the Menasha family of Salonica, Greece, along with the community of Salonica. And we'll get more into that as the program continues. But I also want to introduce you to this beautiful family. What I've learned in my studies of the Holocaust is we always focused on the survivors and we forget about all the millions of people that were murdered in this tragedy. So what you see pictured here is my father-in-law Nassim, who is the centerpiece of my talk tonight, with his sister Sylvia, who will also be a big part of the talk, as well as Oro, the survivors. But you also have David and Gedalia, the oldest brother, Benny, Carolina, Daisy, who was married to Nathan, Matilda, who was married to David, all of these are Nisim's brothers and sisters you see pictured here. You also see Isaac and Sarah Menasha, and that's all of, that's not all of them. That's a partial picture of Eno's bar mitzvah. There were three brothers in the Menasha family in Sephardic tradition, the, old, the firstborn son of a son is named after the grandfather. So we have three Enos, so there might, seem to be some confusion, but that's, that's the case there. The other thing I wanted to share about is this photo has also been my inspiration. My father being from Poland pretty much got out of Poland with the shirt on his back. I have very few photographs. The Menasha family, we are blessed to have many, many beautiful photographs that I'm sharing with you. This particular photo, I wish I had it in my hands. It's in my home in New York. But when I went to school, yes. Okay, when I went to school, when I taught this in school, they would come with me and they would be in the front of the classroom. And as we're learning the history and the lessons of the Holocaust, we're looking at the Menasha family. We're looking at the people that survived and the people that didn't. And again, as my life went on and the more traveling I did, they were always with me. So let's learn a little bit about this family and Salonika itself. Salonika was a, a vibrant port city. In 1889, it was, it was rebuilt and there was a very large Jewish community. That community excelled in business, uh, banking, wheat. Our, our family had made olive buckets. There was like in New York City with Lit Yiddish theater, uh, Sephardic spoke Ladino, uh, which is Judeo-Spanish in a sense, and they had 
theater and they had newspapers and lots of synagogues. More than half of the city was Jewish. So on Shabbat, it was closed because everybody was in, in synagogue and having luncheons with family and, and friends. And what you see here to the right is the White Tower, which is a symbol of the city. In 1917, there was a fire and mostly everything burned down, including the tower, which they rebuilt. My, so when you look at my father-in-law's uh, papers, my Aunt Sylvia's papers, they were both born in June 15th, 1915, because they didn't know when their birthdays were because of the fire. So they were born around Sukkot, or they were born around Rosh Hashanah, and that's how they figured out what their birthday was. So who was the Menashe family? Menashe family? There were nine children. The oldest was Gedalia. Miss Sim was the youngest brother and the youngest and only unmarried of all the siblings with no children. Gedalia, the oldest, made olive barrels. As growing up, there were nine siblings of Isaac and nine uh, children of Isaac and Sarah. They lived in a modest home with four bedrooms and a kitchen. And Sylvia speaks in her testimony about holidays, they were festive, but because the family was so large, they only had the immediate family for holidays. A traditional family, the girls were taught to knit, sew, cook, to grow up to be housewives. And Sylvia was 28 when the war broke out. She talks about having to wait to get married because she also had to wait until her older sister got married before she did. Again, very traditional. She talks about Hebrew lessons in the house uh, by a rabbi Habib. And she also speaks of the fact that they learned French in school. Knowing French and knowing Hebrew would be very useful for them as we get later on into the story and the Holocaust starts to get to the people of Greece. So now let's meet our family. And the Holocaust Muse Museum and Tolerance Center in Glen Cove, we have what we call a family gallery which inspired my first portion of this program. In the family gallery, you have the Menashe family pictured here. It's Isaac, Sarah, Sylvia, Uncle Benny, and Aunt Doro. This is Miss Sims, two sisters and a brother and his parents. So my father-in-law is a, a few people in the family. If you come to visit our museum, you also have the Elias family photos, Russo family, uh, Jackie Handley's photos, which will be talked about in later programs. So it's a beautiful museum to see. Now, please enter our family gallery. This is a close up of Sarah and Isaac Menasha. I introduced them before as the parents of this beautiful family. Vibrant, um, many children, grandchildren. The oldest brother was 60 when the war broke out. So he had, you know, Again, we, we know the family had a minimum of 60 people when the, when the war broke out. It was probably more based on the children and the grandchildren we lost track of over the years. Pictured here is a close-up of David, his wife, Matilda, David Menasha, Nissim's brother, and their son, Jacko. And they had two other children. Uh, their names weren't on the back of the photo. Again, when you study all of this, it gets lost because when the family that was alive that knew them, we weren't aware enough to ask questions. And what I didn't say in the beginning, I would like to say now, um, as this family grew, as, as I married and grew into this family, as the survivors passed away, we found all these photographs. Not only did we find photographs, we found um, citizenship papers, transit papers. I have Uncle Jack's entire trip from liberation back to Greece, which most of it is now in the Holocaust Museum in Washington. I realized that what we had was so valuable that I needed to pass it on so it would be around for the future. This is evidence, you know, in the times we're living in and a hundred years from now, Who's gonna know who David and Matilda are? Well, the museum in Washington will, museum in Glen Cove will, and so will the public. And they'll also know what happened to them, which we'll talk about later on. So once I did my museum fellowship and this became my project, I, I realized that I'm a historian, I'm a Holocaust educator. It was natural for me to collect this. How many documents are we losing? 
How many photographs are we losing because ch the children are not aware of what's important? So in 2005, I started you know, speaking about this because it was the age where the survivors started to pass away. And it was also when we started to think, what are we gonna do when the last survivor dies? Sadly, it's 17 years later and a lot of people like me and our children and grandchildren are gonna be the ones telling the story. So keeping these photographs and these pictures are of the utmost importance to anybody that has them. I chose to put these two pictures on the same slide because the photo to the left with David Menashe and Nissim's brother, sadly they did not survive, but to the right you have Sylvia and Nissim as young children. And fortunately they survived the war and the family lived on and eventually we start to triumph. What you have here is uh, Pauline, which you'll meet later. And the Sim had a sister, Pauline, who came to the United States in 1930 uh, when she got married. And there was a lot of family photos of July, 1930. That's because there was a send off party for Pauline and Leon. And these two photos are a little Eno Menasha in 1930. And I have taken a second look at these pictures, putting this program together processing the fact that these were young men when, when they did arrive at the platform, at the selections at Auschwitz. So they had potential to survive, but we'll get into the reason, you know, get into the rest of that after. And here we have, you know, Gedalia Menasha, he was the bar mitzvah boy, it's 1937. And, and it also shows you, um, the pride they had in their family with the photos they did take. Most of these came from Pauline. Some of them went to Uncle Benny, who you saw in the first picture, who was in Brussels. And in another program, I just found a photo today of him in 1942, which is very telling because it's right before the everything happened to them. So that's an important part of our family story. Uh, this photo here, uh, we want to expand our family tree. So Aunt Sylvia married Uncle Jack Amar. And again, important to name the victims as well as those that survived. This is Bella Amar, his sister. Uh, Uncle Jack uh, survived the war, but nobody else in his family did. But fortunately, they found each other and it was a, a love story. This is a, a photo from April 8th, 1930. If you look closely, you see uh, Daisy Menasha. Um, I, I, Dudan is the name in the picture, but I listened to Aunt Sylvia's show a tape and her nickname, uh, uh, they call her Daisy. And this is her husband, Albert Russo, and their little son, Alberto. Alberto too would have been about 17 when he arrived um, at Auschwitz. So if you think about that, at least I do, okay. The photo here, we're gonna take a close look at the two women on, on your left here. This is Aunt Oro Jalami. She's living a happy life here. She has a husband, she has two children. Life is good in Salonika. Shabbat is spent with the family, celebrations, weddings, bar mitzvahs. And here you have Aunt Sylvia. I want you to carefully look, we learn in, when we learn about the Holocaust to study photographs. And if you look carefully at Sylvia, she's again, young, happy, life hasn't gone bad at this point. And the sweater she's wearing is something that she made herself. And she's very proud of that. And she talks about that in her show of tape as well. And again, we'll see why this is significant later. This photo to your right, I found in, in an album after everybody had passed away. The only thing I know is this is members, females of the Menashe family, uh, sisters, sister-in-laws, nieces. And, you know, we also learn, you know, you only want to show perfect pictures, but not when you're doing this. This is an important picture. It, 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 it's got a little tear in it, it's okay. It's okay to show those photos. You want to see those photos. A little bit more about Nassim and his family. This is Nassim. It's a photo that he sent to his brother Benny in Brussels. Somehow the family got Benny's photo collection back. And it looks like he's 
graduating high school here. Uh, this is Sylvia, Aunt Sylvia and Uncle Jack, Aunt Sylvia and the Sim sister, and her husband Jack. And this is them on, they got married. She says, right, they wanted, they didn't get married and it was, the war was coming and they saw it coming. So they thought if they were married when they had to go into the ghetto and they had to go wherever they were gonna take them, they could at least be together. So they got married right before the war broke out. And that's their wedding picture. Okay, again, I'm going to ask you here to look at the picture, compare the picture to your left to the picture to your right. Here you have Aunt Oro. She's married to Julami here. She hasn't had her children yet. And then here you have her in July of 1946. She pretty much just got liberated. Um, found out her family is gone and she's doing her best to start her new life over. Again, we'll find out what happened to them shortly. Sometimes you gotta digress. Okay. All right, as we grow our family and we start to see the connection between the Algabas, the SALs, the Amaras and the Menashes, this is Pauline and Pauline Menasha, Nissim's sister. And this is Leon Algaba. Leon was in America and wanted to have a Greek Sephardic wife. He wanted a good Judeo Christian home, a Judeo Sephardic home, and comes to Salonica. He gets introduced to Pauline. They get married. And the pictures that I showed you of Eno Menasha and his cute little sailor suit were taken at the celebration for when Pauline and Leon were leaving and going back to America. Pauline and Leon would have two children. One of them was Lily Algaba, who married our musician right here, Michelle Sal, who was pictured here with his cousins. Again, uh, the, the last name of the cousins of Ben Ruby. Um, my family out there might know their first name, so I could get back to you with that at a later date. Um, but again, this is how our family grew. So Nisim now has his sister Sylvia married to Jack Amar, his sister Pauline in America married to Leon Algava, and his sister Oro married to Jelami and himself. What you have is, this is a map of the port of Salonika. They told you it was a thriving port and it was targeted. It, uh, Salonika was known as the Jerusalem of the Balkans. The city was predominantly run by the Jewish people. They had a great deal of wealth. And because of that, when the Germans went to North, Northern Greece, they were targeted and targeted pretty brutally. Now the family, Isaac, when the, the Nazis invaded Salonika, the first thing he did was hide his girls. He feared for their lives, he feared for their safety, so he hid them. Over time, I, I don't, I'm not gonna say anything settled down. It was, it was scary, it was chaotic. They didn't know what was going to happen to them, but they started to adjust to the changes in, in, in Salonika. Uh, the wealth was given away, uh, not given away, it was confiscated by the Nazis. Uh, people had to move from one, their homes into smaller quarters, they're not in the ghetto yet, that would be later and that happened very quickly. So what did the Menasha family do? You have approximately 60 people, you have nine siblings and the parents. Each sibling other than this Sim had a family of their own. The community of Salonika are very close knit. So there were opportunities for them to get out. In some cases, a boat was hired. In some cases, they look for different transportation out. But every time they had an opportunity, nobody wanted to leave anybody else. So Nisim's idea was to get to Athens because Athens at this point is controlled by the Italians and the Italians did not believe in the final solution, which is the plan which was in, enforced by 1942, the plan to murder all the Jews of Europe. And Italy would not do that. So Nisim wants to get to Athens. He tells the family, they say, no, you can't go. We need to stay together. But 
then time goes on and it's 1942 and let me get to, I just want you to take a look. This is Liberty Square. We're gonna go to that shortly. This is the Baron Hirsch ghetto, which was virtually a transit camp that once the Jewish population was moved in, they were taken to these trains and these trains would take them north to Auschwitz. We will talk to that later. So when we see the next photo, you're gonna see Liberty Square. Now, to the right are the men in Liberty Square. Um, they put them in there on July 11th, 1942 to send all the men between the ages of 18 and 45 on forced labor. Uh, the photo to your left is moving into the ghetto. Again, it didn't last for very long. And I wanna to get to the next photo here, which is them amassed in Liberty Square. And they were taken on forced labor and they, the community was asked, if you pay us two and a half billion dollars, we will free your men. So they pay and the men are free. But now it's July 11th, we still have another year before the ghetto would be formed in February, 1943. And once it moved into the ghetto, you see to the right here, you have train tickets. The, the community of Salonika was told that if you purchase these tickets, if you come with us, you could go to Poland, there are jobs for you. You'll be safe there. You could take your possessions, you know, and you could take, you know, take a few days worth of food, few days worth of clothes but for your journey. And when you get there, you'll have work and you'll help the Germans before the war is over. And, and they end up boarding the trains because they were encouraged to board the trains. This is not a picture of Greeks boarding the trains. I just wanted to give you, uh, the audience, a snapshot of what the cattle cars look like, what it looked like for, the Jewish people of Salonika and the one and a half million that were transported to Auschwitz over the course of the war. And another thing I would like to point out, it's February, 1943, the Menashe family is it kind of in line to get deported to Auschwitz where it's 1939 and into 1941, my Polish family has already been murdered by the 101st police battalion. So another thing we learn about when we study this is for every person you see in that picture, they have their own experience, they have a name, the, the camps did everything they could to dehumanize people by shaving them, by putting numbers on in Auschwitz or on uniforms. And, but again, each one had a story and it all happened differently. So what happens in Baron Hirsch, I don't exactly know when our family got, got transported, but Anne Sylvie and her testimony said they were all on the same transport, but in different cars. And what was really frightening, and I can't, you know, carrying this picture in my heart for all these years, I can't imagine what they felt like when in March they start the, the 43, they start the deportations and they're done by August. By August, 1943, 55,000 Jewish citizens of Salonika are either deported or hiding somewhere, but the majority left, the majority were. So imagine, let me set this scene for you a little bit. Uh, if you think about the first map, Salonika is Southern Greece. They're put on these cattle cars. They have no air, except for a little maybe window in the corner with some bars, a bucket as a toilet, maybe another bucket of sardines or something and whatever they had with them. They are locked in these cars for any, that very different accounts for anywhere from seven to nine days. And in some cases trains broke down and it was longer than that. And think about it, it's March through August. So potentially my family was locked in this train in July, extremely hot. The, the, the stench was awful. The many people died along the way. And then the train finally stops. 
And it's not because it stopped and started over the course of the journey. The train finally comes to a stop, doors open. If it's daytime, they're blinded by the light, by schnell schnell, barking dogs, smoke spewing out of chimneys, complete and total chaos. And if it was at night, it was dark and you have the same thing. I, I always think about them when, I, you know, when, when I'm there and how frightened they must have been when they got there and then, then what? So what Aunt Sylvia does talk about is, this is the gates of, of Ashwood Twan, but she talks about when they arrived, they took her mother on a bus. They said, we're gonna take the old people so they don't have to walk. They want to take her mother on a bus and she wanted to go with her mother and a guard stopped her and, and pushed her away. So the guard saved her life. The majority of our family, once they got to Auschwitz were taken to the, to the gas chambers and, and murdered. Uh, a few survived selections, the younger men survived selections, but what we were told by the people that did survive the camp, because the majority of 90 some, I'm not gonna use 90 some odd percent of the Jews from Salonika were in Auschwitz, if not more. And so the survivors came home, the few survivors that there were, 4% survived out of, uh, so it, what was it, 43,000 were murdered um, in, in Auschwitz. So when um, they got there, speaking Ladino was a problem. The majority of Jewish people there were from Eastern Europe and spoke Yiddish. And Sylvia, and Andoro, Nassim's sisters, spoke French. They also spoke Hebrew, which was French being the international language and Hebrew being the international language of Jewish people. So they were able to communicate somewhat. But I've spoken to many survivors over the course of my life. And they said, when the Greeks got there, it was very hard for them. The climate was harsh. Greeks, Greece is kind of like Florida with the weather. So they had a harsh climate. They a long, long debilitating uh, cattle car, you know, right on the cattle car, and the survival rates were abysmal. And Sylvia and Oro, though, are selected, and they're selected to go to Block 10, which was a block that had medical experiments. But before we do that, the first time I walked under these gates was 2008. Needless I, I need to say it was uh, overwhelming. It was overwhelming for many reasons. Again, that picture is with me. This is where they were. Uh, nobody in our family had ever been to the cemetery. And I also walk in and to the right, the first picture I see of, is of the men's orchestra, knowing that Michelle Asael was in the orchestra. And in the course of putting this concert together, what we didn't talk about in the beginning is Victor Ullman, who was imprisoned in Theresienstadt, most likely walked by the orchestra where Michelle was playing and now their compositions will be played together on April 20th. So lots of coincidences here. Okay. So this photograph in particular, I took myself. I chose to take it because what you're looking at is the death block, block 11. But I took a picture of the windows because Aunt Sylvia and Aunt Oro were in there. And they say they saw Uncle Jack carrying the blocks back and forth in the death block. And they knew another thing about being in a concentration camp, survival rates depended on all sorts of things. Uh, a lot of times it was just luck. But the job, if you had a job where they you only carry blocks back and forth all day long, living on, uh, black coffee in the morning, the soup in the afternoon with no, nothing in it, sawdust bread, you're not gonna last very long. So, and Sylvia and Andorra, now we're gonna understand why knitting was important. They made beautiful, beautiful clothing. They took apart a blanket and they somehow crafted some needles and they made themselves socks and sweaters to keep warm. The guards, noticed their beautiful handiwork and started to ask them to knit things for their wives, for their children, for their girlfriends. 
you survive that way. They traded the knitted items for food and they could last longer. And when Aunt Sylvia talks about Dr. Klauberg, she said, they experimented on us. They only had one experiment and they sterilized us. And that she said she never had children because of that. And listening to her testimony, like I said, I tried to put myself in their shoes and having been to Auschwitz a number of times, I, like I said, you could never be there like they were, but my imagination, you know, I would look and imagine what were they thinking? What were they feeling as all of this was happening around them? Where is their family? They were block 10. They didn't know. They just knew they were taken away and they knew the chimneys were spewing smoke and ashes. And that's really all they did know. So Uncle Jack does get transferred. And this is just a snapshot of the numbers that were taken and of the 55,000 Jewish people from Greece that ended up in Auschwitz, 45,000 were from Salonika and 43,000 were murdered, 2,000 returned. And what you see is also a one and a half million total people were taken and murdered. Our next photo was also uh, very overwhelming on the, well, basically every trip. Uh, this is a picture of Birkenau from the Watchtower. It's not even close to all of it, but it's it's a snapshot to give you an idea. So in Birkenau, I imagine, what was it like for them? For the few that survived the couple of days, for Michelle's sisters that were in the orchestra, uh, Lily and Yvette, you'll learn more maybe in the next program about them. What was it like? You know, how did they... How did they survive? What did they feel like? And it's also the cemetery. It's the family cemetery for us. And again, I'm the only one that's ever visited this family cemetery. What you have here is as you, as you're, excuse me one moment. That's better, I just need a little light. <laughs> okay, it's getting dark. All right, what you have here is as you're in Birkenau and you walk towards the back, it's massive. And at a cemetery, you like to have a marker. You like to have a place that you could visit to remember your family. And sadly, ours is in, all of ours are in Poland. Uh, which, so this is one of the unmarked graves. And it was the first time I saw it, I chose this spot to lay down a marker. I had gone on the March of the Living and you make plaques of your family's names and you, they want you to leave it there. But I took mine home knowing that I'd be traveling the following summer with the Holocaust and Jewish Resistance Teachers Program where we, for that 1,100 teachers over the course of time were taught about Holocaust and Jewish resistance. And I was with them there and planted the plaque, asked for a few minutes to myself so I could mourn them and talk to them and talk to them about the family that we were growing. And I also, this shoe here is a child's shoe that was donated by Jackie Handley through the Catania family. And I imagine Jackie was a Sonder commando, and I imagine this could be one of our little nieces and nephews because the Dahlia did have grandchildren at this point. So it could have been one of ours, but I chose to place it here as a reminder to um, remember. Okay, so we're going to leave Auschwitz Birkenau and go back to Auschwitz I. Auschwitz I has a, a beautiful museum that was built by Yad Vashem. And it, when you walk in, it has visuals of life before the war, which is really what I wanted to express this evening more than anything else. This Menasha family, the Jewish community of Salonika was vibrant, full of life, and it was stolen from them. At the last room of this museum, there is a book of names, thousands and thousands of pages. There's Menasha pages, there's SAL pages, there's Alcaba pages, Amar pages, Bias pages. And ironically, 
you know, it's natural when you're traveling with people, they look for their own names. And ironically, some of the teachers found their names there and these are not Jewish people. So they started to like go back and say, wait a minute, maybe I am more connected to this than I thought I was. Okay, so the war is coming to an end. The Russians are going to liberate Auschwitz and Germans don't want it, them to find anybody. So death marches are formed and Uncle Jack, his death march takes him to Dachau and then Sylvia and Aunt Doro go to Bergen-Belsen together. This photo you see here is right after liberation. And again, let's take a moment. Uncle Jack, it's a side view. You really can't see the sorrow. I mean, I can't see the sorrow as much, but if you look closely at Aunt Sylvia's eyes and I just see a very, you know, imagine she got back from the war. They, Uncle Jack, Amar, Aunt Sylvia, Nassim's sister, Aunt Oro, and Nassim, who is, oh, I didn't do that part, did I? Hiding in Athens, did I do that? No. Okay, let's, let's back up a little bit. Okay, well, I have Sylvia and Jack and Oro had been deported to Auschwitz. And we're gonna go back a moment to Nassim's story, the star of our program tonight. Nassim, like I said earlier, wanted to go to Athens. He knew he could be safer there because they didn't believe in the final solution. When he first inquired about it, he didn't need as much gold lira as he did as they were moving into the ghetto. And another part of that, that early part of the family story that I just want to talk about now is also before they were moved into the ghetto, the three brothers and the father each took an olive oil bucket, which is what they manufactured, filled it with gold, chose a house to bury that gold in. So when they got back from the war, they would have something. Sadly, Nissim only knew where his gold was buried because nobody wanted to tell anybody else in the event they get captured or tortured. So Nissim ends up getting to Athens, which is how I got married my husband. So he gets to Athens. And how does he do that? He buys his way. He arranges to take the train to Athens. They disguise him as a fireman, is the, the per, people that shovel the coal to keep the train running. He gets to Athens and he's a businessman and he does have some, some money with him. And he said, establishes a business and now he has to hide. You know, the war is gonna come, the Germans are gonna come to Athens and he's not safe. So he's introduced to a 16 year old girl, Katie Menasha, Katie Hakosaki, who became Katie Menasha, who had a sister and a brother and another brother had passed away from starvation. So they were a very poor family. So Nisim offers to marry Katie. The Hakasaki family offers to protect him. He hides with them as a Christian. And then when the war is over, they all make it back to Salonika and find each other. And Sylvia and Oro are kind of surprised that their brother has a, you know, his brother has a wife, but it saved him. And that's important. So Nisim survives as well. And the community starts to rebuild. What you're looking at here is you're in Athens and the survivors of Greece are invited to a ceremony with um, the light Rabbi Barzillet. And this photo here, you could see a little bit better if again, study the faces. These are survivors of a country, the Jewish community was destroyed here as it was in the rest of Eastern Europe a vibrant, beautiful community murdered for no reason other than the fact that they were Jewish. They didn't do anything, say anything. Okay, so here, Uncle Jack is in this photo. And if we go back to this one of, at the Holocaust Museum in DC, they, um, they were able to recognize and name some of the people in the photo. And I'm sure some of you out there, uh, I know I see your names from our community in Salonika and the rest of Greece, you might recognize people so I could share this later. 
Okay. Okay. Chose to put this document in and not Uncle Jack's. This is Aunt Sylvia's citizenship paper. So we're going to focus on this for a moment. For some reason, they chose to say distinctive marks was the tattoo on her left arm. So how did Aunt Sylvia and Uncle Jack and Miss Sim come to America and become citizens? It was 1951. Imagine you're back from a war. There are four of you. Um, I'm including Uncle Jack in this because now he's part of the family. But 58 Menashes were deported. 56 were murdered to return. Those numbers are astounding. Pauline survived because she was in America. Miss Sim survived because he was hiding and living as a Christian. And it was 1951 and their quota numbers came through and they moved to America. Uh, Miss Sim will move to America uh, a year later in 1952. They eventually settle in the Bronx and try to rebuild the community. It's not just Salona, it's all sorts of other, you know, from the other towns in the early map, uh, Castoria, uh, Yanana, many of them. And they gather in the Bronx, at least the Menasha family did. Others went to Brooklyn, different places. So they rebuild the community. They build a synagogue. You have, um, I know I'm going to make people smile now. You have the pastelero, which everybody loved, and the butcher. And again, rebuilt Greek Jewish life in the Bronx. And my father in law, being a businessman, started a business on the Lower East Side. Again, uh, many of you out there, you know what I'm talking about. Your father started the same way. He started with a push cart. The push cart became a closet, the closet became a bigger store. And that retail business supported his family for his whole life, along with many others. Uh, Sylvia talks about, yeah, you know, she didn't have children. Um, she was sterilized during the war and they chose, Uncle Jack didn't want to adopt anybody. So what she does, she talks about my husband in her, in her, in her video, uh, Jack and Eno, again, another Eno because you name it after grandpa. And she, she looked upon them as her sons. She helped raise them. She did her best by them. They both did. And we take care and we took care of them as they got older. That's what you do. Okay, these pictures here represent the future, the beginning of the future. The picture on your left, uh, and also the people that are inspiring the Hymns of Auschwitz program. You have Dr. Albert Menashe here, who wrote the first account of the story of the Jews of Salonika which was the best account written recently republished by Dr. Joe Haleo. And here you have Michelle conducting 25 years later. But what does this picture represent? It re represents a community whose lives were shattered, who came to America, who rebuilt their lives, who had a zest for life. Everything was celebrated, bar mitzvahs, weddings, births, 20, and Sylvia and Uncle Jack, not having a, a, a real wedding during the war, had a 25th anniversary party that was a wedding. And who entertained everybody at all these parties? Michelle and Papas. Um, he, his music was great. He was a kind, gentle, intelligent man and a big part of our family, you know, holidays together. Same thing with Aunt Sylvia and Uncle Jack. We would have holidays at at their home and me being an Ashkenazi girl, it was strange to me, but we learned the new customs of the Jews of Salonika. So what I wanna do right now is introduce you to the growing Menasha family. And we would like you all to join us on April 20th for the Hymns of Auschwitz as we debut Michelle's piece for the first time. In the next program, you'll hear him hopefully speak about it. And it's from the Menasha, Amar, Al Gaba, and SAL families whose lives were stolen. And please join us the second, third, and fourth generations in Carnegie Hall on April 20th and celebrate the triumph of survival. Thank you very much, and I hope you had a good evening. Thank you so much, Meryl. Um, 
So I, I was thinking as you were speaking, uh, you, you tell the story so well. Um, this is your in-laws. Um, so I was wondering um, about your family. Did you ever tell the story of your family and their uh, story of survival? And how did you come to uh, uh, start telling the story of your, of your in-laws? I have, I have created the story thanks to Elise. Um, at, at HMTC, I've created the story of my father and that side of my family. I have not presented it at this point. I'm looking forward to presenting it. As I said, the Menasha family, we have a wealth of material. That's a hand, that's a, a this much of, I have more photos. I have more documents. I had so many documents to tell the story from my father. I have a handful of photographs. I don't have one of my grandmother, which again is something common among children of survivors. And I have handwritten when my, when I was teaching, I had my father, fortunately, because he didn't think he was a survivor. His story is different. He was in the army, he went to Siberia. And so he didn't consider himself, that was in the old days. So anyway, uh, I invited him to speak to my students and I videoed it. And I thank God every day I have that tape because in his words, I have what happened to him. What makes me sad is the older I got and the more I studied, the more I realized how important the life before was. But I was so focused and on life, on, what, on the war itself that I didn't ask enough questions when I was younger about the life before. He spoke about my grandmother loving Shabbat, inviting people in. So that's for another time. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to invite everybody um, to um, either unmute yourselves if you have any questions or comments or feel free to raise your uh, virtual hand, the hand emoji or raise your hand um, or write your comments or questions in the chat. Um, Joseph, um, yeah, ask the question. Love to, okay. Joseph, you would like to unmute yourself? You can. Uh, yes. Um, Thank you. Now, the reason I, hi, it's Joseph. Um, yes. Uh, the uh, CEO of Pfizer's, uh, Al Bora, yeah. came from uh, Greece to, I believe, Salonika also. Yes, did your family know? Did your family know his family? Uh, yeah, our family knows his first cousins. So yes, we don't know him personally. But Daisy, you're out there. Uh, <laughs> Daisy, I'm not going to use names. I don't want people to, you know, use last name. That's not what. Yes, uh, we, we have members of our community that are related to Dr. Bola, and we are very proud of that. And think about it, 4% survive. Look at what they've accomplished. But the, Greek, the Greek community owns so much, has built so much, has revitalized itself. We're doing the best, you know, and, and again, when they were targeted for, for murder and, and almost succeeded. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ellen, uh, you had your virtual hand raised and Evelyn. Hi, I, I came in a little late, but um, it, I just think it's just wonderful that you have all of these pictures and memories. I have some, but not much. I mean, my parents, my, they're not, nobody's really around much anymore. So I can't, you know, but I have, I do have some pictures of my grandfather who was who also went through some of that, his family. But my other, my father's, my father's parents, he was from Hungary, his father, but his, his mother was from here. But um, yeah, I, that's why I cherish whatever pictures I have. And when my mother was moving out of her house, she threw out some pictures. I almost, <laughs> I was hysterical, but it's very nice that you have all these, cherish all these memories. So I went, like I said, because I have nothing, um, I'm trying to track down my father's pictures, but I, I need to get to Israel for that. And like I said, traveling right now is- No, yeah, not to I, Israel. And, you know, I'm, 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 I, and I think that's why I, you know, got into my Menasha family because we had so much to share. And I wanted mm -hmm. all you out there that are two Gs to understand and three Gs what to share. and. We also have to remember all the, like I said, the, the community of Greece has, Jewish, like Martin Elias is one of the our big donors at the Holocaust Center. And again, because of his success, 
he believes in giving back to the community and he has. And I mentioned, I think the containers who gave us Jackie's picture and so on. I went on one site. It wasn't really Ancestry. It was just, it was had to, had to track down some of your family. And I did find my mother's parents, my mother's father. If and would, it's Ellen, if you would like to reach out to me, I could guide you into how you could find Okay. Me. Yeah, I did find some, you know, but, but it was nice because I knew what he, he started out being, he was a tailor that I remember, you know, and, and he started being a tailor, you know, tailor back uh, years ago. So it is nice to know, but you know, unfortunately, I have no not much. It's just me and my sister, and then my aunt who lives in uh, Arizona, and she's like ninety one. She doesn't remember. She didn't. I don't know. She's got selective memory anyway. But anyway, but thank you. It, it's thank very you, nice. Thank thank you. nice. And Evelyn, yeah, and thank you, Ellen, for sharing. And Evelyn. Well, go. Can I say something? Uh, my uh, name sure, Sammy. We'll come to you in one moment. Is that okay? We'll we'll ask Evelyn. Uh, we'll have Evelyn ask her question, and then we'll then we'll jump to Sam. First of all, I'm really happy to see you, Meryl. Hi, Evelyn. <laughs> and I loved your story, and I wanted to know. I don't know that much about the Greek Jews, and can you do you know how far back in years the families go in Greece and? where they came from before that, or are they native? Yes, I could talk about my family and Aunt Sylvia in her show with tape said they were there for many generations. They, they did uh, originate in Spain. I don't, I haven't tracked the family that far back is all I know is this community. And thank you for asking that because I wanted to mention that this community was there for generations when they were completely taken and destroyed, just like the, the Eastern European Jews. So five, six generations, they Sylvia and Sylvia talks about. Thanks, Evelyn. Good to see you. Yeah, I have a question on the same topic, but I'll you can come back to me after. Thank you. My we'll just jump to Sam and then we'll uh, Yeah, so we'll jump to Sam and then Janet. Uh, Meryl, I just want you to know that uh, Albert Menashe delivered me in Salonica in 1947. That's awesome. And that's and, when he he, he he delivered you and wrote a book in the same year. It's amazing. And that's when Michelle wrote his symphony. A lot of coincidences. Sylvia and Jack and I, I remember very, very, very well. Uh, they were my, my parents' friends. And I have pictures of them in my bar mitzvah. What's your last name? Yecheskel. Because my, my Jackson, my husband Jackson, so maybe. My mother, my mother was an Algava, Lucia Algava. And uh, she got married. She was, hers was the first wedding in Salonica uh, right after the war. So we're Mishpuka. Yeah. <laughs> Very uh, nice to meet you. I hope to see you on April 20th celebrating Michelle and Dr. Menasha. I hope so. Thank you. Hi. That was beautiful. Thank you, Sam, for sharing that. Hi, Daisy. Daisy's uh, hand is up. Hi. Oh, sure. Um, if you don't mind, we'll just go to Janet first, then Hi. Daisy, and then Edward. Hi, Meryl. Um, it's, it's really nice to hear your story. I'm sorry I tuned in late, um, but so interesting to hear about your husband's side of the family and how the Greek community was just annihilated. Um, the, the, the first, I'm, I'm a, um, a child of survivors from Poland and Belgium, which is more common where, you know, you hear stories obviously from Poland and my mother lived in Germany. The first time I became aware of the Greek community of the Jews, I had a student, I'm, I'm also an art teacher at Lawrence High School, and one of, one of my students' families told me that they, they were from Greece, and they said, do you know about how the Jewish community was just almost completely wiped out? And I said, no, I, you know, I, I knew nothing about it. And at one point I went to a synagogue on the Lower East Side. I believe there's a Greek synagogue there. On Broom Street, Kahila Kadosha. Yes. Yeah. And um, we did a tour with Huntington Jewish Center of, of the Lower East Side and we covered that. And um, I just, my question is, is two parts really. How the Greek community reformed itself with so many of them who, who were annihilated, missing, how they came together and were able to create a community on the Lower East Side, and then what was it about the um, the killing of the Greeks that that made like how did they disappear so so um, broadly? Like why was it just impossible for them to 
Okay, I'm going to talk out. about Salonika because the other cities, Salonika was targeted eighth because it's wealth, and that's where they, it was known as the Jerusalem of the Balkans. So uh, when they left Greece, they gravit- it was a very tight knit community. And when they left Greece, they gravitated towards each other. So little by little, with quota numbers, our family ended up in the Bronx. There are other communities in Brooklyn that I know about, but we ended up in the Bronx and that's where they built the this, this synagogue. And how did they rebuild their life? What was the second part? Well, I was just curious if so few survived how they were able to um, come together and form these these synagogues. I guess they just came I'm from all leave, over. I'm gonna talk to, I'm gonna leave that to Daisy uh, in a moment. But basically this is a community with love and devotion to each other, for each other, for their religion, and they wanted to rebuild their lives. So yes, 4% survived, and look at what we have accomplished since. It's just, again, that's what I wanted to bring out in this program more than anything else, the vibrancy. My wet, I mean, my wedding was at one heck of a party because half the guests were from different parts of Greece and Michelle was the orchestra Mm -hmm. and it was an incredible evening as were the many other weddings and bar mitzvahs we attended that again a zest for life Uh, and Sylvia kept saying what could we do it happened we're here we need to move forward she pretty much wiped it wiped it out she doesn't talk about it she didn't talk about it much she said whatever happened happened and we're here and we need to live and that was yeah, really Pretty remarkable. The ones I knew. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. I think Daisy's up. Unmute. You have to unmute. Da- there you go. Yes. Okay. Yes. You're good. Okay. Th- thank you, Meryl. It's always wonderful to hear your stories, and thank you for everything that you do as an Ashkenazi. <laughs> To keep us Sephardim alive, really. Thank you so much. And you're a very good speaker, very interesting. So I always love coming to these things where you're speaking. And um, Sam Yehaskel, I we used to come to your to your apartments, my mother and I, when when you were little and I was little. So we were there. We used to come to the apartments in the Bronx. Um, and um, as far as rebuilding in the Bronx, it was, it was like there were millions. There weren't millions, but it was like there were millions for the energy and the dedication and the love that all these people had for each other. Would you um, say they loved us a little too much sometimes? <laughs> oh, <please. laughs> but I, as far as, Jack and Sylvia Amar, I always have them in my heart because because they did not have children, they really loved all of the children like their like we were their children, really. I I have a watch that Uncle Jack because he he worked in a watch company, for a watch company I I still have that watch the bull of a watch it was my watch, and um. It was just, they were a fabulous couple. They were wonderful. They were the two tallest people. (laughs) Um, And as I was starting to say that the Bronx was the most vibrant, wonderful place in which to grow up, because as I said, all of the people, we were not, we were hardly related to each other, but we were related. Um, And it, it was it was the most unbelievable life. Every day was exciting because we were all in each other's lives. We traveled in packs. We went to Rockaway in the summer together. Uh, when people moved from the Bronx, they all went to Forest Hills together. Um, the Pastelero was there. That was like a tremendous meeting place, especially Sundays. And um, the, the synagogue was the Mecca for a lot of the life. And as you said, Michelle was, he was it for all of us at our weddings. We had, we all had memorable weddings because of Michelle and the extended family of all the Sephardim. Um, and I, I miss them terribly. I miss everybody terribly. 
and Michelle's sister was my piano teacher. So it's all in the family. And again, yes. I keep all these people in my heart. And thank you again, Meryl. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to do this and be the, be the speaker. I think Joe has his doctor. Joe, you have your hand up there. My partner in crime, actually the leader of this pack, not the partner in crime. <laughs> oh, thank you, Meryl. Um, you know, this partly came out of Dr. Menashe's book. Um, I knew Dr. Menashe my whole life from he was the, when he was the doctor at the Sephardic home in Brooklyn. He came from Salonica in 1951. He was the president of the community there and then came to the United States. But in the camp, of course, he knew Michelle because they were both musicians. Dr. Menashe survived by playing in the orchestra at Auschwitz and was, was able to get other Spanish Jews from Salonica into the orchestra as well. So Michelle was able to survive. And when Dr. Menashe wrote his book, Michelle said that he couldn't write a book, but he could write a symphony and he did. And for many years, I used to ask Michelle to share the score of the symphony and he used to say, oh, you'll never do anything with it. And we never did, he never shared it until just last year when the book was published, his daughter, Debbie, who's also a musician, shared the score with me and we were able to put together this musical program. So the symphony will premiere the first time at Carnegie Hall on April 20th. It's a Holocaust music program. It's a, it's a modern symphony with, I understand some, some Middle Eastern tone. Um, I've never heard it because no one's heard it yet. So I'm looking forward to hearing a symphony that I've never heard before in the, in the, con, in the context of a Sephardic program at Carnegie Hall. There aren't many Sephardic people who have played at Carnegie Hall, only a handful. You might know some of them, Edie Gourmet and Neil Sedaka, Joe Amar, and of course, Murray Pariah, who's probably the most famous Spanish Jew from Salonica, most famous musician among the Spanish Jews. And his first teacher was also Michelle's, Michelle Lasalle's sister, Lily, who was a musician, a piano teacher. She was Murray Pariah's first piano teacher. And um, I hope you can make the concert. Dr. Menashe's book is available um, I, I think we, Thorin put it in the chat. Thank you for doing that, Thorin. Um, if you send me an email at the email address in the chat, I'll be able to arrange for you to get a book. So thanks for everybody, to everybody for listening and Meryl for putting it all together and to everybody else who participated. I think we have a question from Avi there. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, we have Avi and then Edward. And yeah. uh, thank you, Joe, so much for sharing that. Uh, again, it was a privilege to hear you, Meryl. Uh, two questions, I apologize. One I may have missed. Uh, as again, they spoke Ladino. They go to Auschwitz, Yiddish, German. How did they communicate? And then I'm also curious, how did the Greeks communicate when they got to New York? They didn't have the Yiddish. They, or I don't know if it's your in-law who knows this, but I'm very curious about such a minority who did make it and survive. How did they make it in America? Well, and in, in, in the, when they got to Auschwitz, there's one, uh, Lena Russo tells the story. Uh, when she first got there, they questioned even whether or not she was Jewish. And then she was able to speak to them in Hebrew. So during the program, uh, and Sil the Menashe children were schooled in France, French and Hebrew. So if you got to Auschwitz and you spoke Greek, French and Hebrew, you'd be okay. But if you're just Ladino, and that's why you hear the stories of the people that did survive, not the Greeks, the others, that the Greeks had a very, very hard time. And in America, I mean, my father-in-law did very well speaking Spanish. Ladino, it's not Span. I mean, I don't know the language, which I'm sorry to say I don't, but he was able to get by. He learned Spanish better than English. He, he spoke English. And then when his sons came into the store, he went back into Greek and Spanish. And also another fact of the war, is when it was over, people came to him because he spoke Greek with a Ladino accent. So some people in Athens knew he was Jewish, but they liked him, so they didn't give him up. There's all, all these side stories that will come out. Beautiful, thank you. Thanks for the question, Avi. Um, Edward, and then I think Gloria has her hand raised, so we'll come to you after Edward. Meryl, thank you very much. Uh, this was an amazing journey you took us on, you know, like a, 
I know a few people that, that are Greek, you know, that, that have told me some, but the way you told it was amazing. I just want to say uh, that the guy that's, that, that's running this thing, he's related to me. <laughs> and that's how he got his good looks. Anyway, I, I wanted to say something. You were talking how important the pictures are. My son, my father didn't have any pictures. He came home. There was nothing left. My son just found the picture. It's very emotional for me just to speak about it. In my, I'm, I'm in my 70s. First time I saw a picture of my grandfather and, and my uncles and my aunts. Michael just found the picture a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So you said it's how like important. I've, I've, I've never seen that, you know? It's very important. And like you said, I can't get my father's because I can't get to Lvov at the moment. Or can I get to, to Israel? So. Yes, you will. You will. Thank you. I know. Thank you for sharing that, Dad. And, you know, before Gloria, I'll just interject before uh, you speak. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I was actually going to say that was one of the things I thought you did so well out of everything was um, to bring their stories and to to name these people. And it was absolutely beautiful to, again, as you said, we have to see their eyes and, and see their faces and know their names. And I think you did that so beautifully how you uh, wove that into this um, testimony and the presentation. So I really appreciated that. And as my father said, uh, looking at all these photos now, um, it, it means so much. It really t helps tell their story. But another thing I noticed I was doing, uh, you said you were the family historian. I started to, to do this as well. And now anytime I go to a Holocaust museum, for example, I look at all these photos and I'm scanning for, for faces that I might recognize. So it, I've been it doing that my whole life. I still do it. I'm still doing yeah. it. Yeah. So I appreciated that when you shared the, the picture from Athens and you and we're starting to name these people. So yeah, thank you for that. And um, and Gloria, sorry to, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> to interject. Okay. I'm just curious, since this was such a small and closed community, um, have any medical genetic studies been done since they are so unique in that respect? May I refer to somebody in the audience on that? Dr. Halio, you have any in input on that? It wasn't really a small community. No. Salonica, Salonica was, the argent, was the largest Jewish urban center in Europe. No, I think she she's asking one. about the survivors. But, was studies yes. done on the survivors for any side effects? What kind of studies? I mean, well, I don't think we could do studies well, like that, but I can any, tell you that as a physician- studies that may have been made that would have any unique particular uh, genetic um, parts of this particular community that would be so different from the Ashkenazi Eastern European Jews or- um, I honestly, there, I are, there is some genetic information. There are some there are some diseases that are specific to the Sephardic community that don't show in the Ashkenazi community. Like, yeah, that, uh, that was the kind of thing that I was. But I don't think it had any whether. bearing on the Holocaust. Um, like, for instance, uh, glucose six dehy glucose six dehydrogenase uh, deficiency, or pop more popularly known as Favism is found in the Sephardic community, but not in the Ashkenazi community. I don't think we really need to talk about that now. No, I, mean, I don't think so. I, think I just wanted, it. since I had you here. Okay, we have Loretta and Michael, it looks like, right? With hands up. Loretta? Oh, I think you're there I am, okay. Hi, Loretta. Yeah, uh, qu quick question also, Meryl, I apologize. I say thank uh, you, it was a wonderful program. It was a lovely evening. And uh, like Daisy said, we all grew up together once we came uh, to the States and we lived in the Bronx and we were we were family. We'd go to temple together, we'd go to school together. It was, we were in each other's houses day and night. It was amazing. And I have to really give a lot of credit to all our families and our parents because they came here with nothing, no language, nothing at all, nobody to help them. Uh, the highest try to put us in different places. In fact, I wasn't scheduled to come to New York. I was in another place and then we came here. And, but they worked there, they worked so hard and they really built a wonderful life with their families and their friends. And like she said, we were all family. But again, thank you so much for this. It was a lovely evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Loretta. Bye. See you soon, I hope.
in Carnegie Hall. <laughs> Michael, thank you for patiently waiting. Oh, no problem. Thank you. I want to say uh, to Meryl, excellent. Thank you so much. I had a, I have a colleague um, who married into a Greek family who was here today. Uh, she had said, do you know much about the, 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 um, the Holocaust survivors or, or, or Spanish Jews? And I said, no, but I'll, I'll send you this link to a, a colleague of mine who's presenting and you can find out. And she was here today. Um, I also want to tell the audience that um, Meryl has a, a couple of other uh, accolades that she's too modest to describe. One is she was the adoptive survivor um, a representative for a great uh, a great Auschwitz survivor named Irving Roth, who you may have heard of. He's uh, internationally known, major speaker. And um, in that role, she learned uh, a lot and shared a lot about Irving, uh, who, um, who was an amazing Holocaust educator. And um, she keeps his memory alive. And like, like many of us, she's um, helping to share that memory about, of, of Irving Roth through a textbook that I am co-editing um, with my cousin, we're two G's and we're Hungarian origin. Uh, and, and our textbook, uh, which is, I think Thorne's putting it into the chat. Um, it's a, a open or free educational resource that's gonna be coming out this summer. It's called the Holocaust Remembrance, um, Respect and Resilience. And I wanna say that the, it sounds like the Menasha and other uh, and related families are, our models of, of, of resilience uh, and that Meryl is, is helping us all to respect their, um, their achievements and memories. And, and it's just uh, wonderful to see these projects weaving together. So thank you, Meryl. Thank you, Michael. I see Joseph has his hand up. Joseph, do you want to unmute and ask uh, your question? Yes. Um, do you have, is there any plans or do you have, or have you ever, done a, a cookbook of recipes from, um, you know, passed down from uh, survivors or from those who are no longer around. I mean, if they, you know, if there was passed down to them, it would be interesting to have a, a cookbook uh, uh, of uh, specific recipes from the Jews of Salonika. We do have, I have in my possession, it was, it was a, a Salonika community from a Greek community in California from a synagogue. I do have that cookbook. There's also two Holocaust survivor cookbooks that came out, but they're not Greek focused. They're uh, survivors from all, all different countries and all different places. And again, it puts the recipes with their stories, but that's not Greek. But I do have one that is a beautiful cookbook and it wouldn't be a bad idea to republish it. But I, have, I don't have that on my list right now. I have a few other things pressing like a concert in Carnegie Hall and a professional institute that we're launching come this summer for in Irving's name. So there's a few other things that take precedence right now over that, but it's a great idea. Uh, Loretta, Daisy, do we wanna start gathering recipes? <laughs> Not a bad way to go. Thanks, Joseph. And, and we do have a few links in the chat. I just want to remind everyone. So the purchase tickets to Carnegie Hall concert uh, on April 20th, we do have the link in the chat and hopefully we'll be able to add that to our follow-up email and uh, maybe we can put other links in there as well. Um, and, uh, you know, Meryl, I just had one question I wanted to ask you. Okay. Um, yeah, so you were talking about finding these photos later in life. Um, so how, how did you, all come across uh, these photos. How did you? As uh, the Nassim passed away, and his and Sylvia and Uncle Jack passed away. Like they said, we were there. We were their surrogate children, so it was our responsibility as their children to empty and clean out their possessions. Within their possessions, we're seeing all these papers, and my and my husband Jack is saying, "We don't need this." He said, "Oh yes, we do. Give them to me. I'm keeping every last one of them," and they were treasures. And you know, like I said, I've been doing this my whole life. I interviewed Holocaust survivors when I was in high school, in college, so it was just natural for me to continue when I married into this world. And I like Daisy and Loretta. I thank you so much for painting the picture that I couldn't paint that you did of, of the community. It's, it's a beautiful, 
community and we need to celebrate together some more. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, anyone have any other questions or comments and that otherwise we'll pass it on to Thorin. I wanna thank uh, you both, Merrill, for sharing such a beautiful story tinged with, of course, the, the sadness, but you show a way of telling the story that makes it uplifting by talking about the resurgence of the Greek community, uh, both in Athens, uh, in, in Salonika after the war, and then here in the United States. And it really changes the whole feeling for the program. So thank you so much for sharing that. Michael, okay. thank you always for hosting and for being our uh, the conveyor of all the various questions and such. So thank you so much for doing that. I want to add what I know Merrill has already mentioned and what I put in the chat and just one last plug for this concert that we have coming up on April 20th. Merrill's program here is a kind of a, a touched or a, a hint towards that program and we have a few other programs coming up later in March and then earlier in April which connect to the story of Salonika and the story of Michelle S.A.L. and that, um, that symphony, symphonic poem that we're going to be hearing in Carnegie Hall on April 20th. You can buy tickets from our website. I put the link in the chat, but www.hmtcli.org and click events and you can find it there. So thank it is you. Going to, yes, it, well, it's gonna be remarkable. Once you hear that, the, it's just gonna be, it's gonna blow you away, so you have to come. <laughs> thank you Sorry. so much everybody for joining us. Thank you again, Meryl, for, for sharing this story with us. Thank you, everybody. Have a can nice- Can I add one more thing? Sure. Oh, no, Marilyn, I just wanted to say when you would when you all were describing the Bronx, I mean, it was the same. I was born and raised in Far Rockaway in Rockaway, you know, by the beach and um, the community was it was so similar. I mean, you know, I'm younger. I think my parents were fairly young at that time, you know, young, um, but it was so similar. I mean, we were all we had so many friends and so much. Everybody did things together. Everybody watched out for each other. It's like. And whoever's left, we still we're still in contact, so it's nice. But uh, the older generation, they're all gone. So you know, my parents. Are, but it's it's nice to keep them alive. That's what this is all I about. I know, I know. I and wish I had more are. pictures. Yes, and thank you. This is really terrific, Meryl. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening. Thank Look you. Forward to seeing you, you too. Again. You too. Good night.